Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Hey yo man, it's your time. time. And fuck poverty. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Film Leroy the Judgmental Podcast. What's up, everybody? It's your boy Phil in the house. And I'm Leroy. So what's going on, Phil? Nothing much. Chilling, chilling. I was just telling you I got back from getting a massage. She tore uh-huh. me up a little bit. <laughs> right. Not not that uh uh not the extra massage, a real massage, right? <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> nah, my wife, my wife, uh she scheduled this joint. I ain't even knowing. She booked it and everything. So I'm like, oh shit, I ain't even know I had to go. So we had this flip flop because my appointment was for at one. And this massage lady, she liked to give you an extra 10, 15 minutes overtime without charging you. So I was like, I ain't gonna be able to do it because I, I got this the, the podcast to do. So we switched and I went at 12 and then she went at one. Uh, and I the girl cheap as shit because she only charged a, a dollar a minute. So I, I gotta, used to just go for an hour. You gave her a good recommendation. So I'm gonna have to check her out. Yeah, she money. She and she was walking on my back. So I was like, I'm just curious, how much do you weigh? And she started laughing, it was like a buck ten. And I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we got a guest here. We got a, a podcaster, a, a former military vet. Uh he's a, a a pro wrestling fan who won't put me on a group chat. I asked him about the group chat. He won't put me on. <laughs> I'm going to put you on today. I'm going to put you on today. Right. And he's, uh, uh, is it your uh, fraternity? Is it Ida Phi Theta? Iota Phi Theta fraternity. Okay. Or Iota Phi Theta fraternity member, uh, host of the uh, Unwrap Mind podcast, Mr. Hezekiah Grice. How you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great, man. I am a fan, as y'all know. I love listening to y'all episodes. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, man, this is I, it's a pleasure, really. It's a pleasure to be on the show that I listen to and that I, I enjoy and I recommend to people. So thank y'all so much. And also, yeah, yeah also we have the, uh, the third member of the Judgmental Podcast, Lamar, because you always keep calling me Lamar for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Lamar, the, the Phil and Lamar Judgmental Podcast. So shout out to Lamar. <laughs> it's, it's Leroy. I know it's Leroy. Hey, y'all got to think. I'm totally unscripted. I'm sitting there with nothing. Like when y'all hear me, that's one shot, one kill. That is no paper, no pen. So if life changes 10 minutes before I walk in that room, that's exactly what y'all get. No, we the same way. We just wing it. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I, yeah. I start from Wednesday night. I start whatever I record Tuesday night. I start my next podcast going that next minute all in my brain. Right. Because mm-hmm. um I'll have like a, I guess you could say like a little script, like going into a, a when we talk about a news story, and I will read that. But other than that, it's pretty much just us, just just freestyling. And yeah, and y'all vibe is crazy, man. Is is y'all vibe is what I hope my vibe sounds like because I listen to y'all and I swear I feel like I'm sitting on the couch just hanging out with people I didn't know 30, <laughs> 40 years because y'all conversation is y'all y'all know each other. I'm assuming y'all grew up together. Nah. Flat out, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. So I, we've known each I'm gonna other. Take over the, I'm going to take over y'all podcast for a minute because I want to know the background story, how y'all met, because y'all sound like y'all been friends since the beginning of the time. So how did y'all become friends? Uh, sixth grade at George uh, George Morton Pepper. That's what it was called, Phil? Mm-hmm. George That's Morton Pepper, junior time. high school. Yeah, sixth grade. Now, now, if you go past Pepper's all weeds and bumblewood and boarded yeah. up with graffiti everywhere, like damn, that's our old school. It should look right. crazy. And you and you know how in school, I, I I don't know if they still do this now. Uh, both of y'all can help me out with this one. They'll put you in alphabetical order. Yeah. So mm-hmm. both our last names are M. So that's how we came in the same class. And then I okay. I went one way and dropped out, and he he kept going and graduated. So. <laughs> back up a while later after that, and then it was like we never missed a beat. Real, and, and that's how y'all sound, man. I swear to God, y'all sound like y'all sound like the the friends y'all is. Y'all been friends for since sixth grade, and it's comfortable. As a listener, I'm just sitting there like, man, these dudes sound like like honestly somebody you could just drink a beer with and be sitting there chilling with. That's so that's what y'all put out to all y'all listeners in case no one's ever told y'all that. Right. Yeah. Like like even with his dad, his dad, I usually call him Pop. You know what I mean? He always called me his son. So like. Last week, a week before, I had uh, plumbing problems. I was trying to fix this shit. It was kicking my ass. So I was like, damn, what I'm going to do? I wind up calling his dad. 
His dad came over fucking. Only problem with his dad, he old school. He's like uh, Robert Harris. He reminds <laughs> me just like him. So when you call him up, best believe he's going to chew your ass out, talk some shit, but he's going to get it done. That's yeah, hard. we've been trying to get him on here because uh, have did you see the movie? Uh, what was the movie with uh, each other name with the horses? The Urban Cowboy movie, Concrete Cowboys. Concrete Cowboy. Yeah. yeah well, that's it. well, my father was a uh, well. I guess you can call him a Concrete Cowboy, and the stalls and stuff they've been to. He was actually in those in those stalls. So we was trying to get him on here to talk about that one, but he never uh he never did. But every time when I mentioned it, he always talked about being on a podcast. So I'd be like, well, all right, then you ready to go. And then all of a sudden he changed his mind and started talking about other stuff. <laughs> I told you you just gotta bring the equipment and pop up because that's just like uh DJ Cow. He said, Oh yeah, I want to get on it, man. I've been trying to get on it for a while. But then when I try to say, like, all right, well, when you want to do it, he said, Oh, I don't know, I don't know. He he brushing it off. But then he turned around and said he want to do it. So you just got to show up with all your equipment and let's go. Right. <laughs> that's how I get people. I don't go nowhere without my equipment in my book bag. So if, it's up to me. If I pop it out, say, hey, we own, we go live. I have my mom. I have my brothers, my sisters. I've had just miscellaneous people. I just carry my equipment with me everywhere I go. Now, what do you use? Um, I, I'm simple. My, my equipment is I got a, a Blue Note microphone and just my computer. I go straight through there unless, and honestly, I think y'all have heard me. I call her the super producer, the warlord of the mix board. If I got my daughter, then she break out the little mixer and everything else and make sure like she takes the producing and directing of it way more serious than I ever do. Mm -hmm. She will keep me on time, on subject. She adjusting the levels. I'm like, wow, it ain't even that deep to me, but she own it. And I love her for it. She, she loves being, she loves directing and producing podcasts for me when I say, hey, I need your help. And she, she tackles it. Well, I do have a Zoom uh, Zoom X8. It looks like a real. It looks like a um, kind of looks like an old school uh, uh, tape recorder, but it has like the inputs that's coming out for the for the microphones. Yeah, and uh, you can you actually you put that in your back pocket. Uh, matter of fact, I interviewed. Uh, this was like the we, when we just had started. Uh, Chase. It, Chase is a guy that. Um, during a pandemic, he was a, a a gym shop owner. So during the pandemic, when the gym shop closed, he started doing stuff in the garage, uh, working out people in the garage. Because I used to wake up and I used to hear people making all this noise. And I couldn't figure out where all this noise was coming from because it was still dark outside. And I looked outside one day and he was like working people out. So I said, you know what, I'm going to ask him to uh, be on a podcast with us. And he did it. So I took my Zoom X8, and I'm like asking them questions and like pointing to them like that, kind of like a microphone. But because you could use it that way, and it has the inputs coming out where you can stick microphones in. But the only thing is the uh, what's carrying would has a lot of. Uh, I had the microphones. I didn't use real microphones, so I have to carry those around. But then I got these microphones that you could put on your shirt. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I'm like hoping that those will. Uh, be better than the other microphones that we've been using. Now, I will tell you one thing. I've got a, 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 a just an ass load of microphones. Thank God I got really good friends. Like, I'm like, I think I mentioned I wanted to upgrade microphones once, and I swear to God, I got at least three brand new microphones sent to me. Various friends like, hey, here you go. We want you to be successful. And I'm like, wow. Like, I don't even, like, should I even be using this kind of equipment? I'm just sitting here with my little Dell laptop. You just sent me a microphone costs almost as much as a laptop. So <laughs> find them album. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. Well, you sound you sound good on there. You really don't need them. It's up to you. You really don't need the microphones. You sound your voice is clear and everything on a podcast. Yeah, you say that to me, but then we get all the comments talking about my voice low. So what the yeah, hell? Yeah. It's it sounds <laughs> it sounds all right. Your voice sounds good to me. Yeah, I hear it. It sounds great. I don't ever. Yeah. It sounds like it's supposed to sound. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. okay so uh you was uh born in akron ohio right i was born and raised all right so uh you got a little you got a little salt salt in your beard <laughs> so i made uh it's two people from cleveland ohio i made references to mc brains now you know who mc brains is right Oh, MC Brains. Because <laughs> 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 when well, we had interviewed the uh, vegan chef, uh, she's in there like early 30s, 34, 33, 34. I had made an MC Brains reference. And she was like, well, who's that? I said, well, you don't know who MC Brains is? 
<laughs> and uh, it was another guy. Oh, he was an older guy. He was um, he's uh, white. He was uh, well, you know how we do the football uh, stuff where we all interview somebody. It, we was playing Cleveland that day, and I had made a MC MC Brains reference, and he didn't know what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> Half hours, you know, MC Brains. Come on now. Yeah, that's a generational thing, and yeah, he wasn't into it when it was a popping. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I definitely remember MC Brains. I think everybody from that time frame we remember because we didn't have no MCs coming out of Ohio at the time. That was before Bone Thugs and Harmony. As you know, I think we had MC Chill. Nobody even heard of MC Chill. So, mm-hmm. uh, MC uh, uh, oh, so you, so you're not gonna claim Bow Wow? That was before Bow Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got to think MC Brains was before High Tech because he from he from the Cincinnati area. Right, I you forgot know. about High Tech. You no, know, the MC Brains. Mm-hmm. So, uh, how was it in Akron? I mean, it is good. For me, I and I tell people all the time, I've been around the world damn near, and Akron is in my top five favorite places to go. I mean, growing up there, when I grew up, it was right at the transition of the rubber the rubber factories closing. Mm-hmm. So a lot of jobs were leaving. Uh, unfortunately, mid-80s, crack hit the scene real hard. Um, Want to be gangsters hit the scene real hard because we got hit with colors and stuff like that. But all in all, the city was just a great spot to be in, man. It was, it was, we was getting our influences from the East Coast and the West Coast. So, you know, I grew up from the from the rap era to the break dancing to just everything. You know, I 70s, 80s, 90s, I grew up in that era. You know, it was just a great place to be. We got all the flavor from everywhere. So one day everything was cool. Then the next day they started banging on colors. Oh, damn near. I mean, colors came out. And then, you know, everybody is either cuz or blood, you know, and um, it just went kind of like, really, like not everybody, but those who wanted to pick that up. That's kind of how they, you know, they roll with it. And, you know, it's sad. And, and I don't even want to I'm going to say it, though. Somebody I know who my age never really let it go, just got convicted of murder. He'd been claiming blood since what, maybe seventh grade. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, dude, we, we from Akron. You know, we we ain't see real gangsters like that. We ain't see real Crips and Bloods. You know, they ain't come through like that. And they did. They came through very briefly, did whatever they had to do and kept it moving because Akron just wasn't that spot. You know, people from Detroit came through, did what they had to do and kept it moving. Akron just wasn't that spot for that kind of, you know, just prolific violence, prolific gangs like that. We Akron's a small city. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the next question, thank you both for your service. Uh, when did you join the military? I joined the military in 1994. Okay, and Marines, right? Yep. Uh, that's Philip's arch enemy because he's an army vet. <laughs> All right, you're back. I joined. In, I joined in '98. <laughs> yep. You couldn't go two more doors down. You got scared. You seen that red and blue carpet sitting outside door? Was like that was for you. <laughs> The, the the Marines never really uh, interest me. Even as a little kid, I always like I, it's probably because of like GI Joe. But I always was like, man, I want to be, a, I want to join the army. I, even as a kid, I used to draw little army figures. So in my mind, shit, if I think about it, I probably would have did. Not, I still wouldn't have did the Marines, but I probably would have did the Air Force. Mm-hmm. And see, for me, I wasn't interested in the military at all. I was very pro black, very militant. Um, you know. Hung out. I did some time hanging out with FOI. I did some time hanging out with Five Percenters. I was getting influenced on the real black hand side because you know '90s that was real there. Um, life changed. Life circumstances happened, and Marine Corps recruiter literally froze me one day and said, "You know, I'm I I'm gonna paraphrase the story. I know you ain't asking, me, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this story through. I was working at KFC at the time back when it was good." <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking out of KFC and I hear, hey, so I'm thinking it's about to go down. I'm like, uh oh, somebody didn't caught me. I turn around, spin around on my heels. The recruiter, like, what you doing with your life? I'm like, nothing. He's like, you want to go to the Marine Corps? I was like, yup. And it was as simple as that. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, see, uh, go ahead. 
I was gonna say, uh, well, I got family that was in the military, like a couple uncles, a cousin, and stuff like that. But I really wasn't thinking about it either. But around the corner from my grandma, and there was a, a big ass house. Uh, and Sergeant Staver, he's uh, he was the recruiter, goofy, goofy white guy, and he used to always walk up and down the block, and he used to always stop at my step because it was a lot of us just sitting on the steps and wanted to talk about it. And I just like hearing army stuff, so I used to listen to him, you know, and go back and forth when everybody else dispersed. And then after a while, he's like, "Well, you ain't got to join. Just come take the ass back. I'm like. All right, whatever. Then once I took it, it's like, all right, well, what am I what you want? Then it was like they got me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, got you. Uh so uh where were you first stationed? My first duty station. Oh, I can cuss on this platform. I forgot. This is one of them free. Say so what the hell I want to say. Okay. So my first duty station, because I well, I grew up, I always wanted exotic ass women. My first duty station was Japan. Me. Okay. Boy, Mac, Ducos, uh, we were all in school together. Me, Mac, and Ducos all went to the same MOS school. And we like, where we going? I'm like, yo, I want I want to fuck some Japanese girls. We're going to Japan. <laughs> 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 Japan on the dream sheet. And we all went to Japan together, man. And that was my first duty station. I went there in 1995. All right, now, how was it in Japan? How was the women in Japan since you brought it up? <laughs> now, so the women were very good, but I'm married, so. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and what part of Japan is this? I went to Okinawa. Oh, okay. Now, yeah. how far is that from Tokyo? Um, it's about in flight time, maybe an hour, hour and a half flight. It's just the island hanging right off the shore of mainland Japan. Okay, so you've been to Tokyo, correct? Yes. All right. What about uh? The Rapongi district, you been there? I've been to Rapongi. Uh, I've been to, uh, was it Fukushima, Fukuhama? Been, I've been to a couple of cities and a couple of provinces in Japan um, just because we just went around. Like 1995 was really loose. That was, you know, we had that big rape incident happen in Okinawa. But other than that, it was really loose. So we could just hop on a flight on the weekend, go to mainland, have a wild time. Or we could stay in Okinawa and have a wild time. Either one we did. Uh, most of the time, me and my boys stay in the mainland. But every now and again, I mean, staying on the island. But every now and again, we'd hop to the mainland, go see what we could see, and whatever. And I went I went to Okinawa three times. So I had a chance to go to mainland quite a few times. I've been to Fuji. I've been to Disney in, in, in Tokyo. And uh, Philip, uh, Rapongi is like where all the foreigners go. That's where you go and have, quote, unquote, fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Kind of like it's a tourist district. Yeah, you want to go there because what, what people don't tell you is, and you kind of get it from the movies. Japan is very divided. I remember, shoot, fast forward to what 2008. Me and my man is in Japan, and uh, we go to get a hotel to spend the night in the um, in the area because we was traveling via bus, and it was like, hey, we don't take Americans here. What? It's like, no, nah, this hotel will take Americans. But you go down the street to the Hyatt, they'll take y'all. I'm like, how y'all are like, we still doing this? That like bleeding, huh? He <laughs> <laughs> said it in a bad way because they have customs and cultures. There's, there's certain restaurants and bars, they just don't let foreigners in because they're doing whatever it is they do. It's kind of like being invited to the picnic. You ain't going to let everybody come through the backyard because y'all talking and doing stuff that we do that's privy to just us, right? Right now, is it still like that today? I don't know. I haven't been back the restaurants. The eight. I know. I, I remember hearing like when COVID uh, hit, they were stopping a lot of black people from going to different restaurants and stores and stuff like that over at some of those Asian places. I don't know. Um, one of my friends is over there right now. He's doing a kind of uh, just a remembrance tour with his wife, and he seemed to be going into a lot of places that were popular with us back in the day. So I don't know if it's still, it didn't look too restricted. He's in Okinawa. He seemed to be enjoying his stuff pretty well, just based off his picture. So it didn't look too restricted right now. Okay. Oh, was there any other places you stationed? Um, Station-wise, I've been stationed in Japan, Beaufort, South Carolina, Jacksonville, North Carolina, Quantico, Virginia, and uh, out in the West Coast. But I've been tons of other places. I've, I've been, I always tell people, I've been on five of the seven continents. Oh, what's the two you missing? And, uh, uh, and say it again. South oh. America, I've been to South America, and I had never been to Antarctica. So no Brazilian trip yet, huh? Uh, uh, that's not in my future. 
<laughs> <laughs> so how long you was in the military for? I did 20 years. Oh, same as Philip. He did 20 years also. So both of y'all retired, actually retired from the military. Then. Yeah, that's that's if you're gonna go, you might as well go and get that get them benefits, man. Yeah. Now, uh, so you went to college after the military. Right. Not really. I went to college before the military for two semesters and I dropped out. Okay. Now for you after two semesters. All right. So that's where you became. Did you, were you in the part of the fraternity then or? No, I, I didn't join my fraternity. I, I just hit my 10 year mark this month inside my fraternity. Oh, OK, so. Uh, all right. So you did the two years, did the 20 years in the military. Then you went back to school to pick up. Right. Went back to school, got a degree in psychology, um, started working, obviously just worked, work, work. And um, then I got a master's in education and, you know, just kept working, kept pushing through. Now, now do you work for the fraternity? I do. All right. Because everybody works for the fraternity. Right. But do I have an official position in the fraternity to I'm not a working paid staff member. We don't have those. I'm not in any elected office at this time. No. OK, because well, I. On, on your videos, it look on your pictures. I'm sorry, it looks like you were like working. You know, that's like part of your job. Um, we were probably if you talk referring to like the past week or so. Yeah, we were at a regional convention in Orlando for which I was the committee chairperson. So that's I'm working. So I was actually working, making sure that the uh, regional meeting just went well. Everything started, stopped on time. Things were happening. So yeah, I was working, but I don't work fraternity like that. Okay, now we mentioned gangs and groups and all that stuff. You want to show Philip your uh, hand gestures? <laughs> I do not. Our hand gestures are our hand gestures are secret. Now, if Philip is a uh, uh, if Phil is an active brother in Iota Phi Theta fraternity, I will definitely share that with him. But you know, for all intents and purposes, it's kind of like being a mason. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I see that you and your family are avid runners. Do you, do you still run? I just ran this morning. Uh, me, my son, one of the kids from his basketball team, and another one of my brothers. Uh, I'm a proud member of Black Men Run. You probably got it in, in y'all in Philly. You probably got a Philly chapter. Yeah. I, did it start here or is it just a chapter here? It's just a chapter here. It started in Atlanta. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm a proud member of Black Man Run down here in Charleston. Uh, we do group runs twice a week at least. I, Me and my wife, we travel to run. I plan on going to Ohio on in May, run the Hall of Fame run out there, half marathon the 5K the same weekend. But, yeah, very active in running or as active as I want to be. So, yeah. yeah well, I'm uh, running. Uh, this will be my third Broad Street run on next Sunday. I'm coming uh, for that one. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I'll see you there. I want to know one of these years I'm coming to I'm coming to Philly to run. I've never been to Philly to run. That's on my list. The Broad Street Run is on my list. Oh, okay. I thought you was going to be here on uh, Sunday. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I see a few. I see those uh, black man uh, run shirts. I thought they started out in in Philly because they have the black women run and they have a bike one uh, uh, group, right? Yeah, well, they're well, black 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 girls run, and the bike group that you see, uh, they're all separate entities. They're all separate organizations, but we all work together. Like my wife is a proud member of Black Girls Run, so they all kind, you know, we kind of work, you know, hand in hand and talk to each other and make sure we all doing the thing. But um, if you're ever looking for a group of positive black men, and not necessarily black men, most of them are black, but if you look for a positive group. To sit there and have brothers to talk to and stay healthy with, Black Men Run is definitely it. You know, uh, it's not a run club. You ain't got to be the fastest person out there. You just got to be willing to go out there. Right. Now, uh, your podcast, the Unwrap Mind, uh, what made you wanting to start the podcast? My sister. My sister, Morgan. Uh, I used to just go on Facebook Live and kind of just run my face a little bit on my way to work if something bothered me. And... Um, one day we were sitting here for Christmas. She came up from Florida and was like, hey, you know, you should do a podcast. And I was like, word, nobody want to hear me talk. You know, you you always, I don't know. I always think nobody want to hear you talk, especially for no 
extended period of time. And she was like, no, nah, I should give it a shot. And just kind of put the seed in my head, like, you know what, all right. So I sat on it, sat on it, sat on it. And, um, you know, quietly bought me a computer, another laptop, you know, ordered me a microphone. Because my biggest thing is I don't never want nobody to tell me I can't succeed. I don't ever want to hear you shouldn't. So I didn't even tell my wife. Uh, bought my equipment, went upstairs one day, like right before my birthday, recorded the episode and um, just dropped it. Just dropped it. Episode one just dropped. My wife didn't even know I dropped it until after I did it. Now, how long was that ago? That's been two years. Okay, we, we started around the same time. Yeah, yeah, we started around the same time. Now, uh, I listened to your episode that uh, you and your wife, I, it was it just you and your wife went to Dubai or was it a whole family trip? It was just me and my wife. We went to Dubai, met up with my sister-in-law, and then my nephews came through because their mom was, was over there. So they came through near the end of our trip. Now, how'd you like it, David? Man, that is definitely cracked my top seven places to go in the world it was amazing it was beautiful uh safe is all out like i went outside at two three in the morning just to go to walk around the neighborhoods to see what the, what the field was and man you just feel like completely safe as clean as all out and it's is so it expensive everything i'm gonna say everything is relative it didn't you know hotels were probably about the same amount as they is in any normal big city the hardest thing is the flight. The flight was probably the most expensive piece of it. Um, you're going to spend money if you do excursions. It's like going on any trip. The more you do, mm -hmm. the more you're going to spend. Um, right. But you're going to do something. But you're not. We didn't We didn't kill ourselves over there. And you can see from the pictures, we did something every day. I hadn't taken that many pictures since 1995. <laughs> I, think, I, I promise you, I, I was on it every day and people were shocked. They're like, you don't never do that. And I'm like, hey, I was on something every day. But it wasn't that expensive, man. I, I say, honestly, um, outside of the trip, if you got about $2,000 in hand, and we was only there for about seven, eight days, you got about $2,000 you can you can assess, you can access, you're going to be fine. Some people be like, you need $4,000, $5,000. I'm like, I don't know what the hell you doing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't spend that much. I don't even think I saw, I, didn't, I could almost say I didn't spend two thousand dollars, but it was a good buffer to have in case something went wrong. Right. So what about food? Was did the hotel provide food or um the hotel I think provided breakfast, but I went to don't laugh, y'all probably will. I went to Popeyes. I went oh to, no. <laughs> <laughs> you all way in Dubai and you eating Popeyes. No, but I did eat local. You know, I did eat local too. But you know, I love eating. I love eating at restaurants I'm used to going to to see what the difference is. And there's a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, the I'm in the same boat. Get, you say what? I said I'm in the same boat because my wife would be like, "Why are you eating that? You can eat that at home." I'm like, "Nah, this is what I know is going to taste good." <laughs> and you want to see if it tastes different, like like they, right. they how they prepare the food. And over there, and I learned when I was in Japan, KFC has a spicy chicken. And it's totally worth it. It's mm. spicy, spicy. Like you could taste the cayenne coming through. So I had to get some when I was over there. They hot wings really got flavor. Mm. Mm -hmm. I got a, a a Big Mac in Iraq. And here, this Big Mac, the patties, they weren't these little skimmy, skimmy jones we have here. These was like whopper sized patties. And they had like all the works on. I was like, damn, this is what the Big Mac is over here? That shit was money too. Yeah, like, yeah, you don't get that hit. And it was put together neat, wasn't it? Yeah. It looked this like the commercial was good. Like, like, you could tell this is a different burger. Yeah. Over here, it looked like lettuce in a box. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, shout out to both of y'all that would go all across the ends of the earth for a Big Mac and a Kentucky Fried <laughs> Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what it is, man, you, you definitely, when you, no matter where you go, you miss home. You know what I'm saying? You always going to miss those things, no matter where, how far you travel, you're going to. You see a Pizza Hut, you walk in the Pizza Hut. You just do it. All right. So you mentioned like your top seven play, places to go. Now, what was your, what's your top five? All right. Top five places to go in the world for me. Uh, New, in no particular order. New York. I love New York. Um, I love New York. That's a lot. I go to New York every year. No, 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 no doubt about it. Akron, Ohio, born and raised. I love my city. Um, 
I love going to Atlanta. I got a lot of friends and family, and I got a lot of friends and family that I'm, I'm really attached to in Atlanta. They really mean a lot to me. Um, I loved Africa. I totally, thoroughly loved Africa, and I love Spain. Spain to me was really um, picturesque and movie, kind of like you know how you, I always say this the thing that runs through my mind. We were in Spain. You know how they walk through the cathedrals and stuff, and through the uh, what's the little just right in between the churches where all the doves and pigeons be, and they fly away when the person walking through. Mm-hmm. Like that's real in Spain. They fly away when you walk through, and then they just come back and land behind you. You just feel like you're walking in the movie with all the cathedrals and the, the steeples and everything. So I love being in Spain. What part mm-hmm. of Africa were you at? I went to uh, Madagascar. We went to Morocco, and. Uh, God forgive me. I went to Djibouti. What's, what's, what happened in Djibouti? Djibouti is just a, a not a good place to go. <laughs> it's like, um, and I'm, I, I, I don't even want to say that. I don't even want to say almost said. I almost got some people mad at me. But D- Djibouti is like the Detroit of me. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> like, you don't hear nobody say, hey, when, Somebody say, hey, I'm going to Detroit for vacation. No. <laughs> so, Africa, you never hear nobody say, hey, I'm going to Djibouti. Hey, hey, shout out to my friends in Detroit. I got friends up there. I do. But y'all know it's true. And and don't be jumping on me when y'all see me. But nobody vacations in Detroit. Yeah, well, that's the truth. Nobody said, you know what? I, I took a, I've been working all year long. I'm going to take my week, <laughs> my week off <laughs> to go to fucking Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's family there. Now that's different. Even then, they just say we're going to Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so uh, uh yeah, that's also uh it's funny how you put Akron, Ohio is number two. <laughs> and nobody goes to Akron. Nobody be like, yo, I'm going to Akron. But for me, the food and the food in the family. Obviously, my brothers, my sister, my mom, my grandma, my aunts are there, but I love the food. You know, yeah, the best burger in the world is at Swenson's. The best fried chicken in the world is at Rasissi's. You know, uh, the best uh, deli sandwich to me is at Diamond Deli. So I get the food. Well, right off the plane, I'm going to get food before I even see my family. I'm showing up with a bag in hand. <laughs> yeah, what you like about New York? I mean, I, I, I've been in love with New York since I've been a kid. It's always been, for me, is it draws me in, always has. The city is electric. Uh, I love everything. I'm, I'm, I love the boroughs. Everywhere in Brooklyn, I can go and just, where people don't feel safe in Brooklyn, I feel like it's home. Um, you know, I love taking my family there. I, I've learned to go to New York as a tourist. Going as a kid, I went as, you know, with my family, and we just kind of hung out and just hung out because that's what everybody was doing. As an adult, I learned to go as a tourist and be like, yo, there is a Statue of Liberty here. You know, there is an Empire State Building here because New Yorkers don't go there. And when you hang out with New Yorkers, you do New York things. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, it's kind of like Philly. We don't we don't go to the Liberty Bell and all that stuff. But as soon as I sit in the park and try to eat my lunch, a thousand people walking up on me. How do you get to the Liberty Bell? See, mm-hmm. I've never been to Philly. That's that Philly is one of the places. I've never been. I've drove through it. I've drove past it. I've never stopped in Philly. Philly is on my list of cities to come. And and sorry, I'm going to Liberty Bell. I'm going to run up the <laughs> Rocky Steps. I'm going to go visit the Rocky Statue. I'm going to go stand between Geno's and Pat's and take a picture. Y'all, I'm going to do all that tourist stuff. Y'all always like, this dude going to get mugged. I'm doing all that stuff. That's going to be me. Go ahead, Phil, because I know you're about to say something. I was just going to say all the places he said he's going, ain't nobody out there to mug you. You're going to see probably more white people out there than black people, and this is going to be safe. Now, see, I thought you was going to mention the uh, Pats and Geno's thing. Well, he said he's going to take a picture because that is like a historical people know that. Right. Now, he didn't say he was going to get a Pats and Geno's. Oh, I'll do <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? Unfortunately, I can't get authentic Philly because I don't eat red meat. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't eat red meat. I don't eat pork. So, you know, if they don't make it chicken, I ain't getting it. But we all got a lot in common over there. Yeah, I'm a pescatarian. Why are you a pescatarian? I got to know. Uh, there's no real, no real reason that I had made a bet with my mom. Uh, this was years ago. We was going to make a bet that uh, we weren't going to eat any meat or chicken for a month. 
And that was darn near like seven years ago. I like I'm not missing anything. So it's not a health reason or, or anything like uh, that matter. Man, I remember we used to be hanging out at the after hour. Then as soon as we leave the after hour, we hit the all night food joint. We was getting all type of food. So to see you not eating meat no more is crazy. <laughs> and uh, I never not eat meat like chicken. I eat chicken. I love seafood. I don't know. I don't. I don't think I'm ever going to stop eating like turkey and stuff like that. That's mm-hmm. oof, that's that that you a strong man. No, it's it's not what you think. This because. Well, you know, there's a whole bunch of alternatives anyway. True. And I do a lot of alternative meat, but to just say, hey, like, I love fried chicken. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. stereotyp- stereotypical black man. I love fried chicken. You fry some chicken. I got fried chicken in my refrigerator right now that I took from a picnic yesterday. I love <laughs> fried chicken. That's just me. So you fry some chicken, that's going to probably be, all right, you know what, this is whole pesterian thing going out the window. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he said typical uh, black man because he like fried chicken. And I live in a white neighborhood and there's never no chicken wings in the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> you know there probably ain't never no good chicken wings on the table either. They probably make it like smothered and baked wings. Oh, and yeah, they don't know what they're doing. They're, gr- <laughs> they're not barbecuing, they're grilling. You know? <laughs> they're cooking out. That's what they're doing. They're cooking out. They're not even barbecuing. We're cooking out. <laughs> uh, going back to your New York, uh, Phil and I, as adults, we went to New York too as tours going to Canal Street, if you get my point. <laughs> well, we wasn't Seriously. really on our tours mission. We went there just trying to uh, get hang out jerseys. And, and trying to cop stuff on a, on, on a uh, what do you call that shit? Bootleg, cheap underground market? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was during the throwback jersey craze. How all them shops had throwback jerseys, and Philip and I used to sit and try to compare them. <laughs> what was, oh man, we with the all type of jerseys. Somebody yep. got me for all them jerseys too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was, what was that? The modified uh, PlayStation we was buying. Yeah, uh, modified PlayStation, which means you can play uh, copies. You just burn the games. And yeah, stuff. disc copies. Yeah. Um, yeah y'all. <laughs> we had, we had a uh, uh, well. It was a bootleg guy that I uh, befriended. Uh, how did I get hit? How did I get in touch with him? It must have been somewhere online. We I used to get uh, games and movies from him. Well, we started off with movies. Then he told me how to get games and stuff because the the Sega Dreamcast you didn't need to mod it. All you needed was a CD and put it in there, and you can play uh, copy copies. And uh, we met up with him. Well, he's like around our same age and everything. I still talk to him to the day. And then he used to take us to New York with him, with us. And he used to show us all of, all the spots to get the throwback jerseys and uh, modern systems and all that stuff from <laughs> the good old days. <laughs> right. And whenever a new game came out, I'd just be like, yo, Roy, I need this game. And you burn a copy and I was good to go. Yeah. So yep. y'all don't go to New York on a regular basis? No, I haven't been there in a while. And I went, to, I, to the like, last time I went, I went with my cousin, and that shoot, that had to be at least like maybe ten years ago. Man, y'all so close to Broadway and all that, man. I would, I would go to shows at least probably once every couple of months. See, see, this is the problem. The problem is M track. Now you're saying that we're close to New York, right? Wouldn't it be great that you can? T- I could take my girl. Uh, or my wife or somebody, we can hop on a train and go to New York for, let's just say, $40. Because it's not that far a trip. But that's the problem, because uh, a train to New York has got to be around about maybe 150 maybe. And that's ridiculous. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. If we go on Amtrak, it's got to be it's, it's got to be in the hundreds. See, I you would fly to New York for $150 from here. Exactly. You would think that it would be like 40, maybe. If it's forty dollars a piece for a round trip ticket, that's not bad at all. But see, that's the problem. That is it's nowhere uh well you have the the um the Asian bus company, I think that's like twenty dollars to go to New York. Um Might I don't be standing know. the whole ride though. Yeah, they, you gotta stand up <laughs> stand in there. Oh, speaking of that, I walked past there the other day and some lady had their dog, was bringing her dog on there. So can you imagine being a dog with a on a bus with a dog for two hours? No. Now what does that dog I go to bear for? Exactly. They bring more airplanes all the time now. Yeah. Can go to 
Mm-hmm. Not a dog walking around like, leave, leave your dog at home. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you, uh, how long you been living in Charleston? I've been here for, uh, I got here 2011, so almost 12 years. Actually, it's probably been 12 years, depending on what month it is. Been here for about 12 years. Okay. Uh, is it really a lot of Geechee Goalies down there? Yes. This is, uh, and, and the culture is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the culture is amazing. Uh, the, the people, when you meet true Geechee and Gullah people, man, they're, they're they're all about hugs, making you feel like family, bringing you into them, and 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 they'll teach you. So you don't walk away with assumptions. They teach you, and and it's it's lovely, man. You meet the like my barber, he kind of Geechee, but only when he meet other Geechees. Like he can cut my hair and be regular dude. Geechee come in from downtown, and I'm like, dude, what happened? It's like going like when you meet a Jamaican, all of a sudden he see other Jamaicans, and you just feel like the outsider. Like he mm-hmm. came here, I'm like, this is a whole different person back here. It just fade me up, and it's just kind of weird. But yeah, it's lovely, man. I, I enjoy the Gullah Geechee culture. Is 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 something to be a part of. Something to just immerse itself in. So they so they do speak uh, Geechee. They do. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it seems like a nice place to hear. Yeah, it's good, man. It's one of the places like they say Charleston is the most visited place in America. I don't know who they is. But it's definitely a spot worth coming and check out and say, hey, you know what? I've been. Uh, I'm a history guy, so I'm offended by the history to the point where I always say if if if, if the United States is about to start some shit, it's going to happen in Charleston. It's going to happen in South Carolina first. Like, we are the ones. Like, South Carolina is going to be like, yo, we're going to fire the first shots of the Civil War. You know, we're going to be the first ones to succeed from the Union. We're going to be the last people to, to, to uh, segregate. Is always bad. Like all the like bad stuff happens here a lot too, um, but it's 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 you know it is what it is. But I would definitely visit. The history offends me because I'm black, and if you can walk around and, and still walk past buildings that are known slavery markets and known buildings where they used to hold slaves in mass, and you can feel happy about that, or at least not have a feeling at all, I can't mess with you. Because as a black man whose history has probably walked through these cobblestone streets at some point, probably with a shackle around my neck, arms, and legs, I can't feel that. And, and, and some, so the history offends the hell out of it. It does. See, I always thought uh, South Carolina was the nicest place I've ever been. Just because the people were so friendly, so nice. You know what I mean? Everybody I met, people just waving. I'm walking down the street, don't know nobody in horn. Somebody honked the horn and wave at me. I'm like, damn, do they know me? I'm waving back, but I'm like, damn. Because I'm not used to that in Philly. People don't pay you no mind nowhere. Mm-hmm. And they are. I mean, the people are friendly. But when, when you know the history, like I say, if you know the history, you can, you, you'll walk past buildings that they're still using today. And you're like, man, come on with that for real. Like it just it offends you because you you're knowledgeable. Now mm-hmm. it takes from the people. The people are are friendly. You know you gonna have your you gonna have your bad people no matter where you go. But for the most part, white black, you can walk through and people will. They hey how you doing? They'll hold doors for you. you no, know, the su- the southern hospitality is a true thing. But you know it's it's like everything. A history history is what it is. You can't erase it. And if you're knowledgeable of it, you you're gonna be offended. Like I can't go to Boone Hall Plantation. And have a good time <laughs> and, and, and real for real like and it happened when i first got here you know boom hall plantation nice spot they do halloween mazes they do strawberry festivals they do jazz under the stars but they got old slave quarters you can walk in and kind of tour and go through i remember being there and seeing you know white kids swinging around on the fixtures and i'm just like fuck out of it you know what i'm saying like this ain't no place to this ain't no jungle gym you know, right. I'm offended at black man. So I, I was like, we got to go. Like, we, everybody back in the car, we out. You know, so I do have those touch moments because it's offensive to me. Right. That's the thing about being down south. When you driving like that and you see such and such plantation, hey, come to such and such plantation. Yep, when you you're like, plantation, oh, you see plantation, you just you're like, damn. Right. You know, because everything, I live in I live in a place called Liberty Hall Plantation. They're probably giving out way too much information on the internet at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a plantation. Everything's a plantation because that's just a, for Southerners, it's a comfort word. Oh, you know, like like for, like, like when they say green acres or, you know, farm acres, like I think I'm North, acres is a big word for us up North. 
here, plantation is a big word. Where you live? Oh, I live in Hillside Acres. You know, that's a good community name, right? right. Here, mm-hmm. been, you live in Left Field Plantation. Oh, that's a good spot to live. You know, Foxborough Plantation. It's a good spot to live. Crowfield see, Plantation. Plantation word just sounds crazy to me when I hear it. Yes. Exactly. Because <laughs> you're knowledgeable and your feeling is something. And that's and that's what it is. But you see it so much, you're going to see it every day here. You, and literally 365, you're going to see the word plantation. You don't get used to it. You learn to live with it. And that's what happens. You learn to live with it. And I'm, I'm never going to be used to it. So, but it is, the people are great. I'm not, I'm not going down the city of Charleston. Not never, because the people here are great. Now, uh, what's that, uh, there's a, a, a slave holdings where it's like a, a tourist attraction, right? Where they help, what's it called? It's called, it's the market, it's the, it's the open market downtown. Okay. And it was like little, like little, uh, Quarters is it, or yeah, it's like concrete, like where the slaves were, were supposedly in. And that's yeah. like a tourist attraction. It's an open market today. They're going in, you got little tables, vendors selling stuff. Yeah. So like I'm saying, when you walk through, you can be offended. If if you're if you're you can only offend those who want to be offended. That's that's always been my motto. I, so, I sound offended just listening and hearing about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a, a it's a tourist attraction, like where they used to keep slaves at. It's full of people right now, and I'm not even downtown to tell you that, but it is. It's an attraction because most people don't look at the history of it; they look at the attraction of it. Like, okay, this is what it is. They're not looking at the history, and and they tend to ignore the historic the historic part of it, just so they can have the tourist part of it, and. You can only offend who wants to be offended. I, I, I'm offended by it, and partly because I'm offended because I know the history. So maybe right. I want to be offended. Like Phil said, I'm offended just by uh, <laughs> listening to. It. I don't wouldn't want to even go there. But you know what? You will because you like. I got to see this for myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, somebody tell you it was a burning body up the street. You don't want to see it, but you got to see it for yourself. <laughs> right. You know, you like uh, you, it's one of the things you just you got to see it once for yourself because you're like, ain't no way this is real, but it is. Mm-hmm. Well, Mr. Grice, uh, uh, we learned about your background, and uh, everybody, stay tuned to the Unwrap Mind podcast on all streaming platforms. And you know, our podcast, the Film Leeway Judgmental Podcast, we do news stories with uh, audio clippings. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be the first person, the first guest we're going to do an art- article on where you can give your input. You're the first guest. <laughs> and for the first, <laughs> for the first guest, we got a street entrepreneur for you. Street entrepreneur, get your money, get it how you live. It don't matter <laughs> how you do it. <laughs> so we go to Boston, Massachusetts, where it's a Cadillac converter <laughs> death rank in Massachusetts and New Hampshire broken up. Here's the report. They go old school too, uh, stealing got a door Cadillac converters. Hey, there. hey, that's a trend right now in my neighborhood. They stealing Cadillac converters yep. there. Yep. Yeah, and you go in the neighborhood app, there's a whole bunch of people complaining about it. We breaking news: the FBI and Massachusetts State Police. I have a big bust involving catalytic converter thefts. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Paula Eben. We've been showing you for months how this rash of crimes has created big costs for drivers. Officials say this group of criminals stole hundreds of catalytic converters in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. WBZ's Tiffany Chan is live in South Boston with the latest. Tiffany? Paula, federal investigators dubbed this operation cut and run, arresting seven run see how how the news always try to be funny and smart and shoot seven men based out of western massachusetts for allegedly stealing hundreds of catalytic converters off cars here in massachusetts also in new hampshire between 2022 and 2023 pocketing roughly two million dollars in the process two million dollars in catalytic converters <laughs> who would have thought now, U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins telling us that it says 
She says it took these men less than a minute to cut the catalytic converters off did. cars. And that that theft ring at times targeted 10 cars per night. She compared their tactics to a NASCAR pit crew <laughs> where they would all stockpile these precious metals and sell them across state lines to scrap metal dealers, making this now a federal crime. Now, cars without their catalytic converters are basically useless, causing innocent drivers headaches and thousands of dollars worth of repairs. Now, Rollins, along with the FBI and state police, say it took them several months to really narrow in on this investigation, but that this ring, the seven-man ring, their meticulous and organized nature in targeting cars, specific <laughs> neighborhoods, and the getaway vehicles that they use, their organization, their sophistication is actually what helped them narrow in on these seven men. I'll have more on this story at five o'clock. We'll also be talking to a victim who had her catalytic converter stolen. We'll bring you that story on WBZ at five. Live from Moakley Federal Courthouse in South Boston, <laughs> Tiffany Chan, WBZ News. Shout out to uh, Miss Tiffany Chan, who, who Philip made a comment about her lips. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're gonna put it all on blast. I put it over so it's not on blast. <laughs> Shout out there. <laughs> wow, well, let it be known. She uh -huh. she she's a nice and got a nice lips on her. <laughs> so watch out in Boston and, and check your car. <laughs> your Cadillac converter might be missing. Is from those guys there. Shit, you're not far from me, so you better watch out. <laughs> and I'll be the main one laughing at this, and I'll go outside. I'm like, God damn it, but damn <laughs> Yeah, your car going to sound like a lawnmower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess my biggest question is, when you sit down and start talk talking to your boys about stealing stuff, when do y'all say, let's get the Cadillac converters, the catalytic converters? Like, when do y'all be like, hey, we can take the whole car, or we just take the catalytic converter? Right. Well, you, you got to know somebody to off that shit too, too. You know what I mean? Exactly. You got to research that. Right. Because first of all, it's like so old school too, by the way, to be, be a group of guys that just be stealing catalytic converters like that. Uh, yeah. Like, like that's a real targeted like piece of equipment in the car. Like, I remember stealing the car stereo because they were right there in the open, you know. Well, well that's because like, they, don't have, they don't have to go in the car to get that. They just go underneath, cut it, and keep it moving. Yeah, but you know, I, I'm 49 years old. I can't tell you last time I crawled underneath a car. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the thing about it is they have to like time it. They got to practice. Like, all right, we have to do this. You grab the, you grab the jacket, you, you grab the jacket, you lift the jacket up like this. I get under the car, I take the saw and cut it out. You know, you had to like plan it. They probably sat and practice it and prayed and got very good at it too. You got to be thin because the car can't go up too high. So they're like, Steve, go. Steve, slide under. Okay, there we go. There we go. Quickly, go. Boom, time. Man, like 15 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you ain't see Al underneath and Al gets stuck on the goddamn oil pan. And we got jacking up three more feet and people rolling by. Y'all waving like y'all don't need help. Yeah. Uh, uh, you made me think about the, the guy that, uh, remember I told you about the guy that, uh, was towing he was stealing cars but he was like towing it so if you would like go outside and you see someone towing a car you wouldn't think nothing of it but he was actually stealing a car and, <laughs> and somebody cored him somebody cored him in it and, and killed him from doing that yeah, yeah this was this story. one yeah this was like last year right yeah last year so y'all must be like south philly no this was in west philly Cause that's crazy. Yeah, Over it, a car. yeah. Cause I, I, he was like, "Well, who's stealing my car or whatever?" And he pulled out a gun and shot the guy. That was his thing. Well, well, my father like know the guy. Well, he's he like knows him from the neighborhood, and that was his thing. His thing was uh, uh stealing cars that way. He would tow it, and if like you can tow somebody, you can steal somebody's car like that in broad daylight because you would just think that you know they getting their car towed. Yeah. And he said he was, mm -hmm. he said he'd been doing it for a while. That was his thing. I don't know where he take the car at and all that stuff. Uh, he got a hook up somewhere. He probably oh, take it somewhere. No, or you can just give it to one of those Africans that got those garages, and you know they'll ship those cars uh, overseas. They will pay you and ship the car overseas. I don't know that, but how do you know that? Oh yeah, no, what they're the they going to do is. What they're gonna do is they're gonna rip the uh the dashboard out so that the uh the VIN number 
you know, it's not on it anymore. Because once you move that VIN number, you're good. Right. Hey, now, you know, that's, they got VIN numbers, like, hologrammed into the windows and stuff now. Well, those ain't the cars that's being stolen like that. No. Like, you know, low no, level they, cars. They, like, Hondas and stuff. Got Like, my son, he got a brand new Honda. The VIN number's hologrammed into the window. No, that's one of their stuff returns. So if y'all out there, so if he out there swiping Hondas, <laughs> yeah, I'm probably just getting Hondas biggest security secret. <laughs> yeah, well, that's decent though that the uh, the number is uh, on the on the window like that. Well, they'll just pull they'll just pull the windshield off with the dashboard. Oh well, see now you you talking about <laughs> well now if that's a, a update car, you talking about all the computers and stuff that's attached to that windshield it ain't even worth it now because you got to get all that stuff fixed. Well, no, you don't, because if you uh if you take the dashboard off, it's going to eliminate a lot of the uh, capabilities, but the car is still going to run. This is going to be them added features that the windshield can do, like the uh, what's the little screen that you get? You know what I mean? All that shit got to be hooked to computers. Right. Yeah. So you mean so you mean my man in Kenya? He if he get a Hyundai, he can't just have a a, a good a Hyundai with the uh, <laughs> the double yeah, holographic. All that shit. <laughs> Lost his start, huh? Yep. <laughs> you ain't right. You ain't right at all. <laughs> that's, that's what I, 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 I hate to big up my man, but kudos for that ingenious way to steal a car. You know, I'm just going to tow it. Yeah, that's, with the tow. Yep. 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 It, it can be 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And if he was out there uh, uh, stealing the car by towing it, you wouldn't think nothing of it. I'm just right. like, okay, maybe his car broke down. And or if something it's a like nice that. car, you're going to say, oh, shit, he getting this car repoed. He misses payments. Uh, yep. Yep. And, and, and the only way he can get caught, he got to be telling somebody he, he is his own worst enemy. Mm hmm. Yeah, that he was like a dude from the neighborhood and that was his thing. Well, he made a mistake and was doing, doing, when, when, he, when, he, when he got shot. He was doing it in his neighborhood. That was the same neighborhood. So what he should have did is just go all out way out yonder and did something like that and came right. back. You, you know what? And and I heard it. Oh man, I forgot what I was listening to. I was listening to some podcast, and they was talking about how most people get killed in their neighborhood. They never get killed, you know, doing something someplace far. Like it's like you can go out to the to the outskirts and suburbs, you can break in 50 houses and walk away, you'll get away with all day. You do it right there where you at. You're gonna get killed. You commit crimes in your neighborhood. So mm -hmm. it was saying it's safer to go away from your spot to do that stuff. And that's crazy. He got killed right where he at. That's that's bad. Yep. It was like up the street from his house. Oh yeah, that's bad. Yep. So mm -hmm. they already knew about him. Yep. That bring was his that, thing. Bring that shit over here if you want. He brought it over there. Yep. That was his thing in the neighborhood. Yeah. I don't know. When I say that's his thing, I don't know if everybody knew. But I mean, I guess if you were on the street. You know, right. you know. Yeah, yeah, if you're in the street, you know who does what. That's that's street action. Everybody know who you know. You walk in, they're like, "Oh no, that's the dude that's going. That's the money dude. That's the bank robber. That's the hit man. You know who does what. Mm -hmm. You know, street people know each other. Right. Well, Mr. Christ, thank you for joining us. Give us your social media. All right, hey, when well, y'all can reach the Unwrap Mind, I'm on Instagram, the Unwrap Mind. I got a Facebook page, the Unwrap Mind. You can check me out. Uh, Everywhere podcast or drop Alexa Siri, just say play the unwrap mind. My hashtag is the podcast about nothing that's talking about something. New episodes drop every Wednesday. Okay, now how about since you joined us on ours? Uh, I guess set a set a, a date and time where we can uh join join you with your uh news stories and everything. I gotta get fancy like y'all figure out how, how to do this because I'm really basic. But uh, as soon as I and, and I know you're going to I know you're going to hit me up because I'm going to get your email address. You're going to DM me your email address so I can put you in a wrestling group. Mm -hmm. And then you can tell me I can make this happen more often so I can bring in guests. And when when I get it set up, where I can bring in guests because I don't edit or anything. I go straight from record to to play. Mm -hmm. um, you guys will definitely be the first guest because I'm going to bring this energy to everybody so people can hear you all <laughs> across the board. I'm just going to let y'all do everything. I'm going to let y'all take over. It's going to be y'all on the Unwrap Mind. Y'all going to be the guest host of the day. Right. Um, you can just use Skype and uh, you could use Skype and how I send you the link. You could just send the link to, you know, whoever, whoever your guest is. 
But how do you record it? And because I upload my stuff to Buzzsprout, how do you upload it? Okay, well, it may be a different way to do it, but this is how I do it. Okay, it's recording. When it stops, it's it's just an MP4 file. Mm -hmm. I convert that to MP3, and then I use uh, Audacity. Audacity, that puts the music in and all that stuff, the intro and the outro. Sometimes I'll have to edit a bit. But see, when we have guests like this, I don't have to edit anything because I didn't say, well, stop, hold on or anything like that. So uh, uh, so now I'm just going to use Audacity to, just to add in the music. Save, okay. it as a, save it as an MP3 and then upload it to uh, Anchor. Well, it's Spotify podcast now. All right. Well, I'm going I'm to give a test run. And then if my test run works well, dude, y'all going to be on and, and y'all going to take over the unwrap mine and you know, let everybody get to hear what I get to hear. Hopefully, you know, they are tuning in as much as I tell them to because y'all got it, man. Y'all y'all made me feel comfortable. I feel like I know y'all as long as y'all know each other. Y'all are really good to be on. Hey, y'all got it, man. Y'all y'all two is really killing it. So thanks for having me on. Thank you. And uh, you can reach the judgmentals on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Oh, and YouTube at PL Judgmentals. Instagram at the two underscores judgmentals, or you can email us at pnljudgmentals at gmail.com. I always forget that uh, YouTube have that at now where you could just use at and whatever your name is on there. PNL judgmentals is ours. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you for the kind words, too, Ms. Ezekiah Grace. Thank you. Know, you. Don't forget to send me an email so I can add you to the wrestling group before the next pay per view or live premium event. No, mm -hmm. oh, what's the next one? Um, it's not the uh, AEW. That's not full gear. gear. No, it's not full gear. got something on the 6th of May. Oh, what okay. is it? Backlash. Backlash. Oh, okay. Well, Philip, you can throw your headphones away because that was wrestling. Well, I was going to say, I was going to say, if, do you go to a lot of those wrestling events? I don't. We got one coming uh, the 14th here in Charleston. Um, I don't I don't go because my kids don't want to go no more. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, and actually, if you go to a live event, it takes a lot away from the from you don't realize how much you need the commentators at the live event. <laughs> I was I was going to say, if you sign up for vettix.com and just put your credentials in there, they always got wrestling events on there. They, but wrestling only comes here like once oh, every year. Yes, yeah, so yeah, so yeah, we're a bigger yeah. city, so we get a lot of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you go to live events, you realize the commentators are the show. Seriously, like you'll be like, this sucks because you need to hear Corey Graves in your ear. You need to hear him talking through the matches. It's it's horrible without it. You know, he's been good lately, especially I like how he do those. Uh, I guess uh, people's not in his ear no more. How he talks about Japan. Uh, he'll little, make a little side remarks. And I'm like, he's for I say probably like this past. Like, we give it a year. He's been really on the mark. Especially since Vince left. Right. Yeah. He's been right. killing. Yeah. yeah mm. So. All right. But hey, y'all, yo, I ain't going to hog up all y'all time. I could do this all day with y'all. Like I say, I feel comfortable. I feel like I'm on the couch. But uh, when I come to Philly, I'm going to make sure y'all the first two people I hit. I hit Y'all going to be one of the first three people because I got to hit my man up. I ain't seen him in a while. But I'm going to hit y'all up. Y'all can take me around, show me the city. We can run the Rocky Steps together. Right. Pass. <laughs> Pass. Yo, I'll watch you run, run up the white steps. steps. That's <laughs> hey, thanks for having me, though, for real. I'm going to check out the rest of the Knicks game. I know y'all 76ers swept the Brooklyn Nets. I'm about to watch the Knicks finish off the Cavs, hopefully, and, um, you know, enjoy this game. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate everything. Thanks. All right, man. Thank y'all. It's money, man. What the fuck you gotta do, you know what I'm saying? I can tell you're mad at me. Just